Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast, here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, June 23, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? Well, we have much of the same thing we had yesterday. As you'll notice, we had a very narrow ranging day today. What does that mean? From high to low, the market didn't go anywhere. They're above the moving averages, so there's really no change from the daily chart discussion from yesterday. We're going to look a little deeper. There's a couple of other things that I want to point out on some other charts, but from the daily chart perspective, essentially, there's no change. So knowing that I was going to have some extra time on my hands for this video, I pulled out some things that I wanted to discuss over the last several days, but kept running out of time in the video. So tonight is going to be a good time for me to discuss a couple of ancillary things. We're going to get into the bond market, interest rates, we're going to look at some charts, and we're going to have a discussion in the global scheme of things on what's going on. The next thing we're going to discuss is the gold market. We'll take a look at gold, and I know some traders also love to look at silver. So we'll do the same. We'll look at gold and silver, and we'll have a discussion about those things as well. As far as the daily chart is concerned, what's the next major area of resistance on the daily chart? It would have been about 424.50, give or take. They didn't quite get there today, and you'll see this inside the numbers, but the fact that they spend all day underneath that number means that they've built energy for potentially another move higher. Now, if we wake up to some kind of failure on Thursday morning, that changes the picture. Obviously, inside the numbers, I'll have a beat on what the story is over there. But from a daily chart perspective, doing the analysis the night before, we're here to say the trend is your friend until she dumps you. And therefore, it's not out of the possibility. It's not out of the realm of possibility for the market to once again push to new highs. That goes with our discussion about higher highs, higher lows, the trend is your friend, all that stuff. When we look at the 240 minute chart, we'll notice there's really nothing material here. There's no difference between this chart and the daily chart. It's a slightly different look, but the same routine. They're above all the moving averages, and therefore the chart is really the same. The 120 minute chart has a slightly different look, Again, the trend is fine. They're above all the moving averages. You'll notice that we have a breakup candle. We have a breakup candle low. The low is 422.23. There's some other numbers on other charts with similar candles. So we're going to say that that area of 422.23, 422.50, 422.40 in that zone was destined for some kind of a test at some point. You'll also see that inside the numbers. That came in at the end of the day for the most part. We were expecting it maybe a little earlier. We'll circle back to that when we get to inside the numbers. On the hourly chart, you'll notice we have another breakup candle. The low here is 422.43. And you'll see at the end of the day, they did make that attempt to get down there, making a low of 422.51. That's kind of a give or take close enough. Now... What happens if we find the market opening significantly below that number by tomorrow morning, Thursday morning? Well, that would take the current bullish pattern, the bullish flaggish pattern off the table, and we would have something else on our hands. Now, if they were below it, but above these moving averages on the hourly chart, for example, and if we have another light volume day like we had today, They can whip the market around, and that won't be as significant as if they're opening significantly below it, doing something entirely different, like below these moving averages. Again, inside the number members will have a beat on all the numbers and the current schematic first thing in the morning. Speaking of which, let's get into and we'll check out the commentary from inside the numbers today. Pre-market commentary, it was hump day. Wake up slightly green, they're still pushing, overnight they were and the trend is your friend. So basically, there was no change when we woke up this morning. We were in kind of a floater market right out of the chute. Right to the numbers in the early thoughts, let's talk most recent breakout area. How about 422.45, give or take? Is that the general spot? Of course it's the general spot. We just talked about it. 
let's check it out from a 15-minute chart perspective. So what we were talking about was a breakout area. The market, eight time off the clock, broke out, and then came back to retest it. Now, here, it looked like they were going to come back to retest it, and they came up short, and they tried at the end of the day. But that was the theory. That was the number that I had from a support perspective if the market should fall. Would have been much more convenient if they did it early in the day. It would have produced a tradable opportunity. Below that, we had the next number down, 421 and a quarter. You'll remember that from yesterday. On the flip side, we always give the flip side. You have to give both sides when you're the umpire calling balls and strikes. Overnight, they pushed higher. It's normal garden variety market behavior to run a test of some of the same general areas up north if they did that overnight during the regular people session. The area they would be targeting first is 424.35 to 424.50. We already saw that they came up short of that, but that was the resistance area also could have been, should have been, would have been magnetic if they started to push higher. They couldn't really get over 424. By the way, where does that area come from? Shouldn't we learn what that represents? How about a breakdown candle high, and here's the market that went sideways. It ate time off the clock after making a new high, and then it what? It broke down. So what's it doing? It's coming back to test the former breakdown area. So it's the same thing, only flipped on its head. Markets come down to test former breakout areas. We just talked about it. They also do the same thing when you flip it around. So the fact that they ate a bunch of time off the clock, starting with the push higher yesterday, really makes this a little bit different. This is no longer the same type of resistance that it really was this morning. This morning, if they ran right up there in the first candle of the day, I think it would have been a garden variety reaction from that spot in the southern direction. Now, it's not the same type of situation. Why? Because they ate time off the clock, building energy for another move higher. The move higher isn't that far away, so the fact that they ate a bunch of time off the clock makes that breakdown candle high not the same type of resistance that it was this morning. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right, let's see what else we have as the day gets underway. And by the way, we don't have to circle back to stocks on the move. We only had three on the board this morning and not one hit its number. It's very hard to get them to get to support areas if the market is just floating around. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. This morning, it was a true floater market. Let's see what else we have. 921, food for thought. If they can jam price up to 424.50, this is what we just discussed, give or take right out of the gate, it will likely be met with overhead resistance. What does that mean? It means there should be a reaction in the other direction. I'm laying it out for inside the numbers members. And then I cite the reasons why. We just went over them. When the market opened, they were just gyrating around, nothing to do, nothing to see. You just move along until they move. They never really moved today. We had the IWM was strong. We'll get to that later when we get to the charts anyway. And what you're going to see is the resistance was 424.50. We never got there. The support was down at 422.40, 422.50 in that zone. We talked about that already. There it is, 422.45. And they never got there. So they stayed in between both the support and the resistance area all day long. They went back and forth in what I like to call a chop shop formation. So, there you have the entire day. So what I'm going to do here with the notes to save some time is scroll up. You can pause the video, read the notes, double check the work, go back to the charts. So here I'm just putting up a picture so everybody gets the visual of what's going on. It's everything we just discussed. And we're moving along and we'll go right into the end of the day. As we know, nothing really happened until the end of the day. And into the closing bell, there's nothing you can do with that price action. You're running out of time on the clock. One more thing that I want to mention, we'll do this on the daily chart. So the volume has been decreasing and very light the last couple of days. It's been light before and the market can certainly go up on light volume. But I want you to keep this in mind. 
when the volume is light, it's very easy for them, whoever them is, market participants, for them to shove the market in one direction or another. If it's down, the volume will pick up. It will be heavier volume if there's any kind of a sell program initiated on the downside or in the southern direction. On the upside, they don't even need that much volume to push the market up. Buying begets buying, FOMO kicks in, new highs, you know the whole story. I just want everybody to have the awareness that while they lull everybody into a sense of security in the market, it's not going anywhere, nobody's paying attention, it can still make a big move in either direction. And by the way, let's say it does make a move higher. Let's say they break out to new highs. How much higher? They will be, if they do that, in no man's land, so there's really no way to know. A natural area would be 425, but that doesn't mean it has to be a stopping point, maybe just a way station. Keep in mind, the last couple of times they did make new highs, they really didn't get very far. They're grinding, they continue to grind higher, the trend is up, but when they do have a push over the last couple of times, they're not really getting very far. Doesn't mean they won't, just stating a fact. What's going on over in Camp IWM? So they got above for the second day in a row, the 20 period moving average, and they closed above it. So that's definitely a positive from a psychological perspective, being above all the moving averages, the trend is your friend, we know the story. We did have a situation where the IWM was up today, it was up more earlier, it did sell off into the end of the day, and when you look at it, four tenths of 1% up, we can't make a federal case out of that, the S&P was flat. If it was up by the end of the day, one or one and a half percent, I might have a different viewpoint on it. But right now, here's the way I'm looking at it. They're above the moving averages, and that's a positive. Certainly, we know what the weekly chart looks like. The weekly chart looks fine. It is trending up. As long as they continue to stay above the weekly 20-period moving average, the trend is your friend and all that stuff. But when we are the umpire, we are looking at balls and strikes. So... Can't help but notice the fact that even though they made a low, they spiked through the moving averages, and now we've got a rescue operation underway, this is still somewhat of a wedge-ish formation. So this still has the propensity to do one of these routines. We don't know that it will or it won't, but you have to look at all sides of the market. Then one would say, well, I need to know in advance. I need to know the night before what's going to happen tomorrow. And that would be nice. I would like to know also. But the way we do it is we utilize numbers to say, hey, if this market is above a certain number, it becomes more bullish than it was before, and they're going to go to another number. If it's below a certain number, then it becomes more bearish than it was before, and they're likely going to target another number south of that number. Is there a good night Irene number in the IWM? And there is. Based on the recent low that was made, if they begin trading below this low from the other day that spiked through the moving averages and they start closing hourly below it and then daily below it, that's the good night Irene number for now. There's certainly some other intraday numbers that would raise some eyebrows and cause a fumble operation for the bulls but that's the daily chart number. What about the folks down at the transportation department? What's going on here? So they sold off pretty good. We know about the bearish pattern. Then they went down again. Remember, they're into the 20-week moving average, so it makes logical sense, common sense, that they would find at least some short-term support at the 20-week moving average. So how are we going to gauge the transports? We're going to gauge them whether or not they can get back above the convergence of those moving averages. There are numbers involved, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to say if they got back above 15,300 or so, then they're going to start to turn back to the bullish side. However, running a test of the most recent breakdown area, which was what? Which was right here, right underneath the moving averages. Running a test of that spot is what? You got it. Normal garden variety market activity. What about the folks out in Silicon Valley? The Q people. They're basically at new highs. They made another new high today. 
both from an intraday and a closing perspective. There's nothing to see here. The trend is your friend. They're in no man's land. Same routine on the weekly chart. There's really nothing wrong. It's a very, very ingrained, strong uptrend. But the monthly, and I think we discussed this last night, the monthly is just simply too far from home base. It can stay too far. It can get farther. There's no measurement for how far exactly it can get. But the point is, when it does get extended, and how do we measure or gauge extended? It's extended when it looks like it's farther than it's ever been before. And yes, on one hand, that sets a new precedent. On the other hand, it has to come back at some point toward home base. This is a long-term chart. It's a monthly chart. These things take a long time, just using it for illustration purposes. What about the financials, the XLF? They were flat today, but they're making the same bearish pattern that we just discussed from the transportation people. Transports, doesn't look identical, looks similar. Back to the financials. So it makes sense that they can. They may want to. They may give an effort to try and run back up to run a test into those moving averages and near the top of this last breakdown candle. That would be normal garden variety market behavior. They don't have to get up there, but they can get up there, so don't be surprised if they do get up there. But this daily chart, it's not a bullish pattern. It's not a bullish formation or setup. It's actually creating a bearish one. Same routine with the weekly chart. It came into the 20-week moving average, found some support. Is it going to hold long-term, or are they going to build energy for another move lower. We don't know yet, but that's what's on the table. Smash Mouth, up a little bit today, really no change, up one half of 1%, $1.26 out of a $250 stock or ETF, you can't make much out of that. Other than they're above all the moving averages, that's really all we can say. There's nothing any more definitive than there was yesterday. Let's talk bonds. This is the TLT. It represents an exchange-traded fund that supposedly has 20-year bonds and more. So let's just say 20 to 30-year treasury bonds inside the fund. So it's tracking the price of treasury bonds, which is inverse to what interest rates are doing. Interest rates go down, the price of bonds go up, the price of bonds go down, interest rates are on the way up. That's the way it works. So here's what we do know from a long-term perspective. This is the monthly chart. We do know that we're looking for, we're looking at and expecting a long-term rise in interest rates over a long-term period of time, and they're going to rise a lot. We'll just leave it at that. We're talking about years, which means the inverse is applied to the price of bonds. So we started talking about it before bonds topped out. They topped out. Now, bonds have recently been crushed as interest rates were on the rise, even though all the pundits across all the media were insistent we were going to see extremely low interest rates forever. They're wrong 99.9% of the time. We were discussing it at the time. You can go back to the videotapes. The bond market topped out in March of 2020. Go back to tapes or videos before that. We were talking about the fact that the bond market was on a final rally and would top out. So now the bond market gets crushed and it has found support at the 50-month moving average. It found that support exactly a year after it found a top. There's no accidents or coincidences. There are cycles, and that's an example of a cycle. A year is a natural cycle. It's not the only cycle, but it can be an important cycle. Okay, I'm getting somewhere. There's a method to the madness. Stay with me on this. So the bond market finds a low, and it begins to get stability. What it's really doing on the monthly chart is it's really formulating another bearish pattern. So we had a big move down, and now they're building energy above the 50-month moving average, And what they can do is still go higher and still be formulating the same wedge type of pattern for another move lower later. Again, this is a monthly chart, and these things take a long time to play out. Now, 
if in fact we're going to see a further rally in the price of bonds to complete or continue what we just discussed a second ago, where would they go? Well, let's just use a hypothetical. I'm not projecting. I'm just saying that it would make logical sense that they could rally back to this area of this breakdown candle high and also where this 20 period moving average is. By the time they get there, the moving average will be somewhere different. It'll probably flatten out some and begin to move down. But for argument's sake, we'll call it 150. Again, I don't know whether that will or won't happen. We're just saying, let's say that it does happen. Okay, let's flip it around. This is the 30 year interest rate. So this chart has the opposite look. This chart bottomed at the same time that bonds found a top and it rallied. And now what it's doing is it's pulling back. And this is essentially a bullish pattern. Now, from a monthly chart perspective, once this bullish pattern is complete, wherever it completes, let's say for argument's sake, it completes down here near the 20 period moving average, the opposite of the price of bonds. That would mean we're seeing a rise in bond prices and a decrease in interest rates, downward pressure in interest rates in the near term. And I'm not talking about tomorrow or next Tuesday. I'm saying for the next several months, if in fact this plays out that way. Well, if that's the case, and they go up and down in between, but over the next several months, if the trend is to pull back, and here's the daily chart of interest rates, if they pull back into this zone down here, this is the zone we were just looking at, then why are they pulling back is a question. That would mean that the Fed actually, rather than taking the foot off the gas pedal a little bit and drawing liquidity or extracting liquidity from the market, it seems to me that the bond market, if this pattern is right, would say that the Fed is more likely to put its gas down on the accelerator when nobody's paying attention and drive interest rates down, the price of bonds up. How do they do that? They buy bonds out of the open market. They're doing that with money, with liquidity. That puts liquidity back in the system, driving the price of bonds up and the interest rate down. That typically happens when the market, the equity market, is fragile. Not all the time. There's obviously other stuff going on. I'm just throwing it out there for the garden variety conspiracy theorists. Now, let's switch over to gold. So here's a daily chart of GLD. We'll use GLD, which is the exchange traded fund, for this conversation. It'll be fine. Gold's been crushed. Certainly, from a daily chart perspective, it's busted. And let me clarify that or qualify that for a moment. It's busted from what was going on up here. It was in an uptrend. The trend broke. And yes, we can consider this a breakout area. This we could also consider a breakout area, but it got broken. And I want to talk about it from a longer perspective. There's a weekly chart and I'll get to these lines in a moment. And also this black one underneath. It's going to be interesting. Let's pay attention to this. The weekly chart was on the rise. Once it recaptured all the moving averages, including the 50 week moving average, it was destined to run a test of the breakdown candle high and potentially higher, continue going, potentially on a breakout move, long-term bullish on gold. Nothing really has changed from that perspective, and I've said it a number of times, and each and every time I do, I get some emails, and there are traders that think long-term is like next month. When I say long-term, and I'll reiterate this again and again, I'm talking about years. So in between, you're going to have both things. You're going to have pullbacks. You're going to have corrective moves. You're going to have times when it looks like they're getting into a bear market. And you may even have a retest of the ultimate breakout area. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's get back to this weekly chart. So what happened was instead of doing what the thing was doing, going up like this on a breakout, what it did was it failed. Now it closed in one fell swoop below two moving averages last week. That's a broken chart. As a result of that, they leave me no choice but to look at this 
as one of these, and this is essentially an ABC, a bearish wedge is also an ABC, so you have a leg down, which is A, the B leg is here, and the C leg completes when it gets below the low of the A leg. So that's really what we're staring in the face right now on gold. Now, we talk about breakout areas. Well, what if gold is coming down to retest a bigger time frame breakout area? Here's a monthly chart. Can you see where I can make a case for about 150? Here's a big breakup candle. It's near the low. Down here is 141.70. Forget about the exact 141.70. Just think in terms of the general zone, and we can say that this, in terms of a breakout area, and forget about pinpointing it to the penny or to the dollar, but this really is a breakout area. Is that what they're doing? And it's possible, it's certainly on the table, this is a monthly chart, could take a long time. Could be any number of reasons that would drive gold down there. We're not going to project reasons. But one thing that comes up now is, hey, wait a minute. They keep talking about inflation. We see the numbers. We know what we pay for stuff. There is inflation. Isn't gold supposed to go up when there's inflation? And I got to tell you, you've really never heard me subscribe to that theory. And I'll tell you why. By the way, before I do, let me just address something else that's on the chart that you're all saying, hey, what's that all about? So this really is the ultimate breakout area. So this is where we have an inverse head and shoulders pattern that broke out. Now, this has long been completed. And whether you want to call this a head and shoulders or just a trend line that was a breakout area, either way, it's still an area that would be valid if visited. Now, this is a long way off, and I don't expect this anytime soon. In fact, I don't expect this, period. But I'm just saying, if you ever found gold down there, this is an area that would find support. And by the way, by the time it would get to this area, the chart would be forward from here, so we would be forward in time, so the area would actually be lower because it's a sloping trend line. But let's get back to the inflation discussion. Okay, let me do it like this. Let's do a hypothetical. Johnny thinks there's inflation. Johnny thinks there's going to be inflation. Johnny thinks as a result, he should be buying gold because the pundits on TV said gold goes up when there's inflation. In concept, if gold went up during inflation, that would be fine. He would have been right. But here's the reason that I don't buy the story. Johnny buys gold because it's going up in that scenario, and he's told to buy gold, and he thinks since other people are buying gold for the same reason, he should be buying gold too. You can insert Bitcoin into that. You can insert NFTs into that. You can insert meme stocks into that. It doesn't really matter. It's all the same stuff. It's all the psychology behind how this works. So what does Johnny do? Johnny buys GLD. He takes some money in his investment account. He buys GLD and he says, I no longer have dollars. I now have traded those for gold. So if there's inflation, my dollars are worth less, but gold should rise. And then I can exchange it back for dollars later. In concept, that's fine. The Fed has been printing money since the financial crisis in 2008. They've been screaming about inflation. Gold went up back then, then it fell down. Then it went up again, but it never really did what everybody expected it to do. There should have been hyperinflation. They've printed trillions of dollars. Maybe there will be in the future, but it's interesting how it hasn't happened yet. They've printed more money now than they did in the financial crisis in 2008. Gold went up then, but it never really did the same thing again, having printed more money. I shouldn't say it never did the same thing. It did the same thing. It went up again, but it never really broke out and kept going. It keeps coming back, and it keeps coming back as if there is no more inflation, and there is no more trillions of dollars floating around. There is. Nothing has really changed. My view is that each market trades independently of one another. The reasons, the underlying reasons that you hear from the media are never really the reason. You can't ever prove a reason. They just need a story to go along with the thing. And they make it sound like you need to own gold, so buy gold bars. 
You buy gold bars, and if there's inflation, you can walk around with a cheese slicer, slice off a top of the bar, and pay somebody with a slice of gold. That's just in jest. It's not realistic. Having some gold coins, some silver coins around as a just-in-caser is never a bad idea, regardless of whatever the price is today. You're having them as an insurance policy. You hope you don't have to use the insurance policy. That's the nature of the policy. And by the way, I don't want to hear gold is going down because the dollar is going up. That's not the case. That may be the case for a point in time, like right now. But the dollar topped in March of 2020, right here. And we used to think that if the dollar goes down, gold goes up. Loss in value of the dollar, rise in value of gold, a la inflation, all that stuff. Well, what about this? Gold topped in August of 2020. So the dollar and gold have been going down together. So how do you explain dollar down, gold up, dollar up, gold down? You only explain it because it's happening at the time, so it's a convenient reason or excuse. And that's the way this works. Nobody knows anything for the most part. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.